Well, good morning again. It's such a pleasure to be here with you in the house of God to bring you the word. You all know uh, it's my favorite time of the week, and I consider it a privilege to be here. We are today taking a break from our series in 2 Samuel because uh, I think there's something happening like in a week or so. Um, last week, we, we, we stopped our series. We spoke about the Davidic covenant, the promise that God made to King David that one of his offspring would inherit his throne and reign forever. And we saw how all of those promises are fulfilled in Jesus Christ and him alone. And that was a fitting place, I think, to stop our series for a Christmas break. Because Christmas is when we celebrate the birth of that promised king. It's when we celebrate God keeping his greatest promise. And we hear about it every Christmas. I know we all know about the birth of Jesus. We hear about it every December. And you're going to hear about it again next week. But for today, I want to talk about what happened before the birth of the king. Go a few months back and talk about what happened when God stopped a couple from Nazareth in their tracks by revealing his plan to them. Because his plan wasn't their plan. Very often, God's plan isn't our plan. And the fact of the matter is that even though sometimes our plans go unfulfilled, and very often our plans need to change, God's plan hasn't changed, ever. And God's plan will never fail. Even before there was time, even before there was a before to even speak of, God has a plan. And he has been fulfilling it, even though that often means our plans have to change. Like they did for Mary and Joseph. Like they did for me and my wife when God's plan for us included a baby we weren't counting on. Take it back a few years. January of 2008, my wife and I, after a few months of discussion, decided, okay, it's time to take permanent measures. Let's make sure our family stays at four. There I was about two weeks into the new year, leaving my job, and I would always call my wife as soon as I hit the highway to let her know I was on my way. And my phone rang before I got to the highway. Huh. Hi, baby, it's me. I'm on my way home. Silence for like 10 seconds. Hello? Hello? I'm pregnant. So we had a plan, but God had a different plan. And as it turns out, God always gets his way. And what do you do at that point when God steps in and changes your plan like that? You can either laugh or you can cry. I laughed, Janine cried. <laughs> but God showed us that his plan is always better than ours. He gave us a blessing I could have never dreamed of. And we named her Emma. And the name actually means whole, W-H-O-L-E. And as we tell her, it was a fitting name that we picked because God made our family whole when he gave her to us. She is the greatest gift I never knew I wanted. See, we had a plan, and God stopped us in our tracks. He had a plan that was different from ours, that was greater than ours. And I'm so thankful for that, because you know what? I got to admit, I like God's plans better than mine. And we see in our passage today, months before Christ was born into the world, they were Mary and Joseph. They had plans. They had big plans. They had wedding plans. They had an idea of what life was going to bring. They had an idea of what life was going to be, and then they found out God's plan wasn't theirs. And this isn't just about them. I mean, with the coming of Christ, God was revealing the plan he had from eternity past, and it wasn't anyone's plan. It wasn't Mary and Joseph's. Nobody in the world had his plan. Even the Jews, to whom Christ came, the ones who were eagerly awaiting the coming of the Messiah, who were waiting for the son of David to come and sit on the throne. Even they had a different plan for him than God did. But here's the question. What do we do when we realize God's plan isn't our plan? I can tell you what most people do. It's what I did for the first 29 years of my life. Just stubbornly try to stick to my own plan. But the problem is, like I said, God always gets his way. So we can try to stick to our plan, but eventually our plans will fail if they're different from God's. Come hell or high water, quite literally. And unfortunately, most people today, most people right now in the world have a different plan than God does. Some follow other gods, and it's all according to their plan. Most simply just want to live life their way, all according to their plans. And Frank Sinatra. Many just plan to live a good life. I'm just going to be a good person, and someday I'm going to go to heaven because I'm not going to do anything so bad I'd be excluded. That's their plan. None of these are God's plan. These are all plans that will fail. 
I think we're all familiar with plans failing. We make plans, big plans, small plans, and we know what it's like when our plans fail. I mean, how many here, if you're 30 or over, how many here can say, when I was 20, this is exactly what I imagined life would be? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, me neither. And I thank God. It's like I said, it is far better than I could have imagined. It is far better than I could have planned for. And what do you think Mary imagined her life would be at this point? When this angel appears to her. After she had just gotten engaged. My oldest daughter Olivia is getting married next year. Wedding plans apparently look like, I don't know, 100 pamphlets from different vendors, a humongous binder like this, and innumerable files on the computer, all for planning five hours. It's crazy. But imagine if it's you, because that was Mary. Imagine if it's you, in the midst of planning like that, an angel of God appears to you and says, okay, sorry, there's a different plan now. It is God's eternal plan, and God has chosen to forward that plan through you. How would you react? Doubt, fear, be resistant and still try to move forward with your own plans? Well, let's see what Mary did. This angel appears to her, stops her in her tracks and just says, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And we read, But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. I think greatly troubled is an understatement probably. I mean, an angel appears to her, and I know we all have images of like the chubby little cherub or like those very, you know, graceful and feminine medieval pictures of angels with the big fluffy wings. Yeah, go read how angels are described in the Bible. Greatly troubled would not begin to describe me if I came face to face with an angel. But you know what we see here? We see here what, we see here what happens when the supernatural steps into our lives in an undeniable way. You know what? It is troubling at first. It can be very confusing. And Mary, like anyone, she just, she needed to take this all in. She needed to understand what was going on. And the angel tells her, don't be afraid. Yeah, thanks, giant supernatural being in my living room. Okay. But he says, no, Mary, you have found favor with God. You're going to have a son, and you're going to name him Jesus. He says he's going to be great. He says he's going to be called son of the most high God. And he finishes by telling her that this son is going to inherit David's throne and reign forever. In other words, he says, Mary, God's fulfilling his promise. God's fulfilling his promise through this child. Now, if that was me, I think it would create a lot more questions than answers. And it does for Mary. Mary says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? She's like, wait, a baby? Dude, I ain't even married. I haven't you know, done what needs to be done in order to make a baby. But her question actually confirms what the angel tells her. I mean, how can a virgin have a baby? Well, it's what God said would happen 700 years before Mary even asked the question. Go back in time. King Ahaz of Judah finds out the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria. They're in league together. They're coming to attack him, and he's scared. We read that, that he and the whole country were afraid. And as a descendant of David, as the king, he knows, wait, God promised there would be someone on the throne of David forever, and he just doesn't see how it's going to happen. So God sends Isaiah the prophet to him, tells him, don't worry, your throne's not in danger. And God says, go ahead, Ahaz, ask for a sign. I'll prove it to you. What do you want me to do to prove to you that my promises will stand? But Ahaz lacked faith. And he says, I'm not giving a sign. So Isaiah tells him this. Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God tells Ahaz, you don't want a sign? Well, here's the sign that the throne of David is going to last forever. A virgin will bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. And this is ultimately fulfilled in the baby Mary's going to have. This is what the angel is saying. It's that the angel tells her to name him Jesus, not Emmanuel. Why is that? Because in Hebrew, the idea of a name often means the person himself. The name of God in the Old Testament is God. So when God promised he would choose a place for his name to dwell, he was choosing a place for himself to dwell. So the name here doesn't refer to what the child will be called. It's talking about who this child is. This child will be God with us. That's who Jesus is. 
And that's why Gabriel even begins the conversation with Mary the way he does. He says, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. The Lord, Yahweh God, he says, is with you, Mary. He is Emmanuel. So the angel explains all of this to Mary. She asks, well, how's this going to be? And the angel says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Angel says, how will this be, Mary? It's going to be an act of God. That is how you, Mary, a virgin, can bear a son. The Holy Spirit is going to work this in you. And the baby will be called Holy. He is Emmanuel. He will be called Jesus, which means God is salvation. And he'll be called the Son of God. No, I can't even imagine that Mary processed all this, especially considering back then she was only engaged to be married. Mary was probably about 15 years old at this point. Think about that. It must have been incredibly difficult for her to understand what was going on. Even if she did understand what the angel was saying, how hard would it be to believe something like this? That's why the angel reassures her. That's why we have this seemingly unrelated mention of one of Mary's relatives being six months pregnant. It's actually very relevant to what Gabriel's saying here. See, God was working all things out. Elizabeth couldn't have children. If you know the story there, there was an appearance of an angel, there was some disbelief, and there was a miraculous conception. See, the angel was telling Mary, God is able to do what's impossible for us. He, God can do the impossible all day long. He can give a barren woman a child. He can give a virgin a child. Even more, he can take on flesh and still be the son of God. And in doing that, he can save us from our sins. And he can save us from death. What is impossible for us is possible with God. But also note the angel points out Elizabeth's already six months pregnant. That's significant too. Because there's more being fulfilled here than just the covenant that God made with David. There's more being fulfilled than the prophecy of Isaiah. There's another promise God made. He said he was going to signal his people that his redemption was near. In fact, it's the very last promise God makes in the Old Testament. He says this in Malachi 4. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. See, the Jews were told, Messiah will come. God says, I'm coming. Believe me, I'm coming. But not before Elijah comes. And those who don't know, Elijah was a very famous Old Testament prophet. He, he never saw death. He was caught up to God in a whirlwind. So really this means there were two great expectations by the Jews in the first century. First, he would be of the line of David. and He would sit on the throne of David. And second, Elijah would come as the forerunner of the Messiah. That's why to this day, unregenerate Jews are still waiting for Elijah. That's why they put out the cup of wine at Passover. They're eagerly awaiting Elijah's coming because they know when Elijah comes, Messiah is not far behind. He said, we know Elizabeth's baby will grow up to be John the Baptist. And Jesus says, John fulfills the prophecy about Elijah coming. It was a spiritual promise. So when Gabriel tells Mary that Elizabeth, who can't have children, by the way, is now six months pregnant... He's not only reassuring her God is able to do everything he says he'll do. He's telling her in no uncertain terms that God is going to keep all of his salvation promises to the baby Mary was going to have. The promise to David would be fulfilled. The son he promised to Isaiah would be fulfilled. The forerunner he promised to Malachi was coming. God really does keep his promises. So let's stop and think about this. Think about Mary. And how God just stopped her in her tracks and interrupted her plans. I mean, she was about to get married. Her and Joseph planned to get married, have children, but that wasn't God's plan. Think about Elizabeth. She was older. She couldn't have children. She was already living her life with her husband, Zechariah, and they planned to live their days out with no children. And God stops them in their tracks and interrupts their plans because their plan wasn't his plan. Think about Israel looking for a literal return of Elijah. They were planning on Elijah coming, preparing the way for the Messiah. And when Messiah came, for the most part, they were looking for a mighty king. They were looking for a warrior like David. He was going to sit on the throne. He was physically going to rule Israel. That's the Messiah they were planning on. But their plan wasn't God's plan. So really, none of the people in the story got what they wanted. 
Instead, God stepped in and gave everybody exactly what they needed. Instead, God carried out his plan and he created life where before there couldn't be life. In the womb of a barren woman and the womb of a virgin. And through that, he stepped in and gave Israel her Messiah. He sent the son, Emmanuel, the Savior. He sent the one who came and created life where there couldn't be life before. He said the one who came to take dead men and women in their sin and give them life. And God stepped in, not just to be the God of Israel, like Israel planned, but the God of the whole world. He came to reclaim everything that was lost through sin. He came to fulfill every promise of God by taking on flesh, by dying on a cross for our sin and being raised to life to overcome death. And he came to bring the good news of the kingdom. The gospel, the power of God for salvation for all who believe. And he was going to move this plan forward through a 15-year-old girl, miraculously pregnant with he who would be called the son of the most high God. And though it was troubling to Mary, how could it not be? Though it was confusing once she realized what God's plan was. Though that meant her plans were out the window and her life was completely changed. Though she had questions. What this young girl does next is amazing. She says, okay. Verse 38, Mary said, behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That is faith. I got to be honest, I think Mary gets the short shrift from us Protestants sometimes. She should be remembered as a woman of great faith. She should be talked about with the heroes of the faith. Because through her and her faith, God carried out his plan of redemption. Through her and her faith, God kept his promises. And this is what the angel tells Mary is about to happen. Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. As I said, this is a promise that God made to David. It is God's unconditional promise of salvation. What the angel says here is just full of allusions to the promise that we talked about last week that God made with David. Even when we're just told that Mary found favor with God. The word is usually translated grace most often in your Bible. It is the grace of God. It is the unmerited favor of God. It is getting what you don't deserve. And I think talking about the great gift of God's grace is fitting for this time of uh, gift giving, isn't it? Now I'm going to be honest with you all. I know Sharon's going to yell at me. If she's not in here, don't tell her I said this. I'm not much of a Christmas guy. I am much more of a Thanksgiving kind of guy. You get all the food, you get all the family, and none of that, you know what, with the gifts and everything else. Because here's what happens at Christmas. Ready? We all buy each other gifts because we all know the other person's going to buy us a gift. That's really the reason we do it. And then we stress over what to buy. Even though the dirty little secret that we all know but no one talks about because we have to pretend we don't know it is that if I wanted what you were buying me, I'd have it. If you wanted what I'm buying you, you would have it. Which means whatever we give each other, we don't want. But now I have to reciprocate because you're doing it for me and I think long and hard over what to get you because I want to get you something you want, which is an impossibility. I'm sorry if I ruined Christmas for anyone. Except, every once in a while, there's that gift that you get that you didn't even know you wanted until you got it. That gift that you really love, that you weren't thinking about. See, those are the best gifts, aren't they? That's what God's grace is. That is God's favor. It is a gift that once you know it and once you have it, you want it so badly. If you don't have it, you don't want it. You don't know you need it. But once you have it, you realize it is the greatest gift you never wanted. It is the greatest gift you can get. And Mary here, who's about to bring into the world the greatest gifts nobody knew they wanted, 
is herself given a gift. She is given the gift of God's grace. We are told that Mary found favor with God. You know, in the Old Testament, when someone finds favor with God, it always means they are called by God for a specific task. Like Noah. We're told he found favor with God and then spent years building a gigantic boat. But all the people we read about in the Old Testament that find favor with God and are given these unique tasks are all pointers forward to Christ. Like Noah, who is to begin a new creation, just like Christ. Like Abraham, who is to be the founder of a particular people that God calls out of the world, like Christ. Or Moses, the prophet chosen for those people. Or Samuel, the priest chosen for those people. Or David, the king chosen for those people. These are the five people in the Old Testament who were said to have found favor with God, and they all point to Christ. Because that is where God's grace culminates. In Christ. In the baby that was going to come from Mary. And that Mary has found God's favor. Imagine being included in God's plan like that. What favor that is to be shown to somebody. Mary, God is going to move his plan of redemption, his plan to save the world forward through you. Oh, it's amazing. And then he tells her, not only that, your child's going to be the king. He's going to sit on the throne, and he will reign forever and ever. He's clearly talking about the covenant with David. First Chronicles 17, we read, God says to David, when your days are fulfilled, to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from him who was before you, but I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. And we see these promises a thousand years later. We see the echo of it come back to Mary at this moment. And the angel says it's time. God's keeping his promise. The angel tells her of her baby, he will be great. He will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. The reverberations of this promise continue to affect the world. It continues to stop in their tracks any people that hear the voice of God promise them his unmerited favor. That is the grace found only in Christ. The grace, the gifts, they are only in the child Mary would bring forth in that first Christmas. And this is the grace that God wants to pour out on all of us here this morning. You want a real gift this Christmas? Look no further than Christ. What a gift. Look at how a child's described here. Look at these promises. He's called a son. That's an echo of the covenant with David. God said to the king, I will be to him a father and he will be to me a son. This is God the son. The eternal God. Yahweh in the flesh. Come for us. What a gift. He says his name will be Jesus. What's in a name? Well, like the name Emma means whole and God's plan was for her to complete our family. The name Jesus is not arbitrary. It means Yahweh is salvation, as I said. Because of the Hebrew name Yehoshua. You know there were other Jesuses in the Bible? There are four other Jesuses in the Bible. And these two are all pointers to Christ. You have Joshua, as in the book of. Conqueror of God. The one through whom God chose to fulfill his promise to his people. You have Hosea, the prophet. Joshua, the priest. And Hosea, the king. In Christ, we have the true prophet, priest, and king who conquers. What does he conquer? What we can't. He conquers sin and death. And as king, he now claims the whole world is his. He is the one through whom God has and will fulfill his promise to his people, and that is a gift. But there's more. He's called great. This child will be great. Talk about expectations, man. You know, I've had tell, people tell me around Christmas, oh, I got you something great for Christmas this year. Never happened to you? Then you open it up and you're like, yeah, 
Yay, Tea of the Month Club. Yeah, thank you. This gift that the angel's talking about, this is God himself with us. It is Emmanuel. It is him giving us himself according to his grace. It doesn't get greater. God is great. And yet because we found favor with him, this great God is going to humble himself to the point of taking on flesh. To the point of becoming like those you came to save. Note the angel says he will be called great. Because you know what happened when he came? He wasn't called great. People called great don't normally set, spend their first night laying in a feeding trough. Great people aren't born like that. Great people, according to earthly standards, they don't die the way Jesus did, do they? At the end of his life, he was reviled, he was mocked, he was beaten, he was murdered. But through his suffering, he got his throne. And now he's called great. Called great by those who have received his favor. The world doesn't call him great. But you know what? One day, he will be called great by all. Jesus Christ, who though he was in the, in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As we saw last week, the greater son of David received his throne through the suffering of the cross. He wasn't great at his first coming. But now, after what he did for us, he is great. Now and forever, he is great. And one day everyone will know that he is great. What a gift. This is when the whole creation will know why the angel calls the child son of the most high God. You know, in the Bible, God is called most high because it's a comparison to the other so-called gods of the world. So in the New Testament, we read of only the demons calling Jesus son of the most high. They know who he is. But here's how amazing the gift is. When God shows us his favor... He calls us children of the Most High. Jesus said in Luke 6, But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. The one Jesus called Father. He's our Father. We who have gotten the gift are made sons and daughters of the Most High God. Now that, that is a gift. But there's still more. The angel says he will be great and will be called the son of the most high God. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. He will be king. The angel says he will be king. Brothers and sisters, he is king. The world doesn't know it. We don't see him on his, on his throne physically, but it is nonetheless true. Jesus reigns. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And he will reign forever and ever. And if God has given you his favor, has given you his grace, has given you the gift, then you are part of that kingdom. Now that's a gift. The angel's not done. He says the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Holy means set apart. Set apart unto God for God's specific purpose. And of course, of course he's going to be holy, this child. He's God. But you know what God says to all his other children? Be holy because I am holy, he says. This is what he says to the children of the Most High. And here's part of the gift. Ready? This is great. In Christ, now we can be holy. We can now, in Christ, live as we were created to live. We can now live lives set apart unto God. Because he is holy. The son of God. Because God's gift to us in the first Christmas was himself. In doing what we could not do for ourselves by becoming one of us. 
by living a life perfectly holy unto God, by taking on our sin and going to the cross because the gift is that good. Dying in our place as a gift to us, all according to his grace. Being raised in victory on the third day so death would be overcome. That's a gift. Eternal life. It was ascending to heaven to sit on his throne where he reigns forever and ever and is now our king. It was giving us the gift of himself. That is the gift. And through that, salvation. Entrance into the kingdom. Eternal life. The ability to be what God calls us to be. This is the grace of God. This is how God favors those who came to save. We read in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now that's a gift. But that's not the end of the story. I know we all love this verse. Some of it has something to do with field goals. I know we all want to focus on the love of God and the salvation of God. And what, and what a gift those are. But the message of the kingdom is more than that. This very passage ends with this. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This, my friends, is the gospel. This is why what God gives us is grace. The angel came to Mary and told her all the wonderful promises God was going to keep through his child. And it wasn't what Mary was planning for. Completely changed every plan she had. She was stopped in her tracks. Her plans were done. And she was troubled by it. And she was confused by it. And she had questions. But God revealed his plan to her. And this young girl said, okay. What is our reaction to hearing God's plan? Honestly, I hope a verse like this stops us in our tracks. I hope a verse like this really makes us reconsider our plans. Because I said, if your plan is not God's plan, it's going to fail. If your plan is not Jesus, your plan is going to fail. And like Mary, if you are favored of God, if you have received the grace, if you have received the gift, then you know what? Just like Mary, God has chosen to move forward his eternal plan of salvation through you. See, that's a gift we can't plan for. It's a gift we don't want until we have it. Is it what we want? Because brothers and sisters, I mean, what more do we need to know that God's promises are sure? That his promise of the king reigning forever and ever, that his promise of salvation, that his promise of eternal life, what more do we need? He already humbled himself and came for us. He became God with us. What a gift. And he promises he will reign forever. And he promises that one day, in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And his grace is so great that he has let us know in no uncertain terms that the time to bow before him is right now. Whoever believes the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. That might be troubling. Might even be a little confusing if you've never heard it before. It may mean you have more questions than answers. But that's okay. Let it stop you in your tracks. Because it's the truth. And that there is eternal life given to those who believe is a gift the unmerited favor of God. That's why he gave his son for us. Christ is calling us. All of us. Right now, Christ is calling all of us to lay down our plans because he wants to work his through us. The king is pouring out his grace and he says to us all, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. How much do we believe it? I'm going to ask you right where you are. Just close your eyes and bow your head. Because listen, they say there are no guarantees in life, but that is not true. God's promises are sure. God worked salvation. It is a guarantee that all who believe in Jesus will have eternal life. This is the eternal plan that God worked in Christ. So right there between you and God, 
answer this question. What are you planning for? When we look ahead, imagine what our lives will be one year, two years, five years, ten years down the line. Does that plan include Jesus? Because God's plan does. So I beg you this morning, if, you're, if you have never planned for Jesus, hear his voice this morning. Repent and believe the gospel. Believe in him who came for us that first Christmas morning. Believe that he has kept every promise and still will. Believe it. It's a gift. If you're here and you know Jesus, what are you planning for? Are we planning to live out the gift that he's given us? Is our plan to share this wonderful gift? His favor, brothers and sisters, has fallen on us. And he has a very special and very specific task for us. And that is to use the gift he has given us. That he may continue to carry out his work of salvation in the world. We need to live lives that say Jesus is our plan. Because salvation is the gift he wants to give this year. God's calling. Like Mary, all we need to do is say, okay. God, work your plan through me. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, good and gracious God, Savior, yes. we praise you this morning. Holy Spirit, move in this place. Yes. Take hearts, God. Turn us all to Jesus. Yes. Help us to see him as he is. Son of the Most High God, great. Savior, God with us. Give us hearts to love him. And Jesus, we thank you. What a gift. What a gift you have given us. Lord, I pray that each of us here, Lord, each of us would live our lives like we understand the gift you have given us. Give us a great desire, Lord, to be those through whom you work your eternal plan of salvation, Lord. Yes, Lord. We want to see hearts changed for you. We want to see lives changed for you. Yes. We want to see, see you in our homes, see you in our neighborhoods, see you in our cities, Lord. See you in this world. Lord, change lives. Help us to know the gift that you died to give us Help us to know you, Jesus. We pray this in your mighty and wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Amen.